Welcome, everyone. We're a few minutes late, but you know what? Here's the thing. Technology, it just keeps getting us. Patty, I am so excited to have you tonight. So everyone, welcome to How to Be a Voice for Kids. And I'm welcoming an educational expert, Patty Crickethagen. So let me tell you a little bit about Patty. And of course, as friends, jump in. If you're watching, go ahead and put a comment over there and just tell us where you're watching from. If you're on Circle Time Success Facebook group, you might have to tell us your name because it won't say who's there. So here's Patty's bio. Patty has been an early childhood educator for 43 years. She taught kindergarten and first grade in Montana, Nevada, and now in Washington. Patty has been a literacy coach for pre-K teachers and parent involvement advocate and trainer for parents of children ages birth through four. She holds a bachelor's of science degree in early childhood education and reading instruction and a master's in early childhood education. So welcome to our fun Live at Five event, Patty. Well, thank you. It's glad to be here. Awesome. And Rebecca, hello from look to all the way over to LaConnor. Hey, she's kind of over by you and squim. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm so I don't know many places. Yes, yes. You're new to the area. I, I think maybe LaConnor's actually at the tip. Is it by Bellingham? Well, uh, we'll have to find out. All right. Cheryl from Everett and Hunter uh, B from California. So welcome everyone who's joining us tonight. Um, again, we had a little bit of technical difficulties, but we are here ready to roll. There is Heather from Nevada. Maybe you know Heather. Cricket, I don't know. <laughs> Heather Marsh. Well, right off the bat, we got to find out, how did you get the name Cricket? Because here on out, I'm not going to call you Patty anymore. I'm going to call you Cricket. And I have a feeling this is going to be a good story. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I was raised by my grandparents and um, my grandmother had, my sister and I are the same age for like three days. So we're pretty close. So my grandparents um, split us to take care of us. So my grandpa would take me out on the tractor with him and my grandma would keep my sister who was a baby at the time in the house. And I guess I made a lot of noise and <laughs> when I was little and he'd have me, in, he had me in a, like a like a crate box, you know, yeah. get some things in there in the winter and in the summer, probably in my diaper and t-shirt. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I made a lot of noise and he nicknamed me Cricket and he's from Norway and he had a, a real strong brogue. So it was Cricket. But oh. yeah, that's what he called it, Cricket, you know, oh, but funny. it stuck. And yeah. in fact, when I went to school, I did not know my name was Patty. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute, Patty, I don't know who she is. I'm not coming up to the board. <laughs> That's awesome. And it's stuck. All right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it, I'm calling you Cricket because that's that's what I know you as. I didn't know for a while that you had a first name either. <laughs> Most people don't. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, my background with you is, of course, we were kind of raised in the same area in northern Montana, but then I was lucky enough to connect with you when you were the director of a pre-K program in Dayton, Nevada for my sister, who still says you are the be best admin, um, you know, director that you, she has ever worked with so awesome oh, I'll pay her later. <laughs> well we're going to start with a question i want to talk about play because play gets a bad rap with administrators who don't have a background in early childhood and with parents who don't see the value in it so i want to ask you why is it important for children to learn through play and what should we do as educators um what should we say when the strategy of teaching is questioned Oh, that's long been debated. Um, I think you really have to go back to who you're teaching. You're teaching children and children learn by playing, by exploration, by discovery. They don't, um, you know, there's a commercial out there that it talks 90 miles an hour and a little, uh, a dad is telling a little person, sit tight, don't do this, da, 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 don't do this. And don't forget to say thank you and please. And now you got all that, you were done. Um, that's what teaching um, lecturing to children is like. It does da 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 da. It's almost like uh, Snoopy com uh, comics, you know, the teacher wah, 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 wah. That's what they hear. And 
but they don't learn naturally like that. So look at a child who is uh, birth to 18 months. They crawl on the floor, they pick up things, they put them in their mouth, they put them in their ears, they put them in their nose. They touch them, they feel them. Uh, they're very sensory. Um, young people are very sensory. Heck, I'm 60 some years old and I'm sensory. Yeah. You know, it's, um, we, it's the best way to learn is through the largest organ in our body, which is our skin. Okay. And so children need to be touching things, manipulating them, um, talking about them, exploring them, uh, using them for multiple purposes, because when they do that, they're playing but they're, they're actually learning. They're learning how to stack things. What, what is balance? What, you know, you learn so you can teach so many different concepts, the concept of um, space and, and relationships and, but you also teach something else that we forget about and that's interpersonal communications. Without play, sitting in front of a worksheet, they're not learning interpersonal communications. They're not learning how to bargain and negotiate and learning their own physical restraints and the restraints of others, whether it be, you know, uh, rules or, or just boundaries. They don't learn that mm -hmm. unless they're doing it side by side and with each other. And I think that's the biggest um, component of it. There's lots more to it, of course. It's very scientific. And you can always dig out all the research and, and use that against administrators. And I love that part of it. But I don't want to go against anyone. I just want to go for the child. And so think about children. How do they learn? Absolutely. You know, and it's interesting because the word play is almost seems to be tied to like what we do on our off time. So we as adults. I'm going to go play golf. I'm going to go, you know, to a play, you know, so I wonder if it's, is it the word that these teachers, uh, that these administrators and, and adults are hung up on who don't have the background? Gosh. You know, it, it is, it is Jocelyn, because when you think about it, it's all about teaching to the test and getting it done and reaching the standard and go, 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 go. And if you're, if you have any downtime, you must be wasting time. It all goes back to that old archaic philosophy of um, children are to be seen and not heard. You know, it's, it goes way back. But it, I mean, think of all the great educators out there all the way back to, um, you know, Montessori and Marie and all of those. It's always been about a child and we're teaching children, not curriculum. We're not teaching books. We're not teaching papers. We're teaching children. And I think it just has a bad connotation in our mouth because we think of play, as, because we're adults, we think recreate. Mm. Okay. And that is fun and pleasure. Yeah. And play for children is fun. It's pleasurable, but it's also learning. That's how they learn. And it's not about unsupervised free for all play. That is not educational play. You have to have a purpose and, and a goal for your children in mind. What are you trying to accomplish? And then make it playful. Yes, exactly. Real quick, little technical thing. We can't hear you super well. Do you have a mic that you could turn up a little bit more? You're saying such great stuff that we don't want to miss it. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh, that was oh tech. <laughs> Well, I hate to tell you, I'm not the techiest person in the world. Oh, you're better when you get, maybe get a little bit closer. That gets a little bit, oh, we can hear you a little bit better. I got it up. All right. I awesome. Okay. I'm so sorry. Oh, no worries. You're just saying such great stuff. And I think this is what's so important for teachers to hear. It's about other ways for us to also understand it. Because you know when you get questioned about something, then you start to almost question it yourself. Yes, And that word, like you said, it's the connotation attached to play. And that's what I think we need to break through. I wish, you know, we could come up with some other word that didn't have this, you know, leisure time attached to it because it really is their work. You know, I always said it was constructive learning. Ooh, you know, okay. Constructive learning. And my little kids would go, we're doing constructions. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, yeah. We're constructing our learning and, and, and. I think, yeah, you're right. If we could come up with a better word, 
But I think as adults, I, if you can get more realistic, that you can actually show play learning and learning through play. You can actually show it. If they will just take the time to come visit you, you can show them all the many things you do. And I yeah. think that's what we have to be. We have to be our own advocates. Yes. Show it in a positive, um, your best light. Yep. And um, you can sell it. You can really sell it. You really can. Yeah. And I think it's just important to remember who we're talking to. You know, we're talking to um, these adults. Maybe they're engineers. Maybe they're scientists. They don't have the background. Don't forget you are the expert. You, you can be able to speak to that. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, these these parents, these administrators, and I, and I use the word administrator. The only reason I do is because I know a lot we're having more pre-K programs in elementary schools. And what happens there is you might get a principal who hasn't had much background in early childhood. And when they walk into your classroom and the kids aren't in their chairs, they get a little bit nervous because they got people up top saying, you know, we need to make sure these kids are ready to learn. So, um, you know, that's why I, I don't want to give a bad rap to administrators um, yeah, by any means. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, what happens if we force kids to, you know, sit in their seats and, you know, skill and drill, sit and learn? What do you think over time happens to children in programs like that where play is not a dominant way of learning? You stifle their learning for one. And we've taken so much away from our children already because we put them in the United States. We put children into school earlier than any other nation in the world. Um, and it's daycare oriented. You know, it goes right down to the industrial age. We needed somebody to take care of the children, you know, so people could work or farm or whatever. That's where it goes right back to archaic Um I don't know what you want to say, thinking, but practices, their practices. And I think um, the one thing you have to remember is that these, uh, if we, if we take a child and we adultify them by um, the, the stress we put them under, the pressures we put them under, the, the expectations should always be high, but they should be high for a child of four, a child of five, a child of six. And you know, you, I know people get tired of hearing all oh, the, you know, developmentally or developmental practices. Well, those really are um, things that we have to be cognizant of, of as, as teachers of any child, or even as a parent, you know, or a grandparent, in my case, you have to be cognizant of that because you have children who come in with all, you know, they're all over because that's how people are. We, we, we learn differently. We learn at different levels. And so you get a four-year-old in your classroom and another four-year-old who's four year old, four years old and eight months. There's a huge difference in eight mm -hmm. months. So you really have to practice developmental um, theory. You have to practice it in your, you have to be present in it. You have to be there and, and be cognizant of it all the time. Otherwise, your classroom of children who are anywhere from one month to 12 months difference in age and sometimes even more um, you're treating them all the same and they're not all the same and that's why you can um, do play learning through play because children will do it at different levels okay i can be teaching spatial relationships and and put out the blocks in it and my four-year-old one month will do it totally different than my four-year-old 11 month that's the beauty of play but yeah. if I hand them both a worksheet, one's going to be scribbling all over it because that's where he's at. And the other one's going to be maybe trying to trace the lines and, and do what I don't want him to be doing because that I don't want worksheets in a, a preschool classroom. And I'll tell you why, because there's so many better things to do with children than sit and watch them write on a whiteboard or a piece of paper or whatever it is. It's they need to be moving those little fingers and developing those muscles before you put those pencils and crayons in their fingers. And before you put a pencil in their hand, you've got to put a little nubbin of a crayon in their hand so they can do pincher grip and, and get those muscles going. There's just so much to do through that you can do through objects and manipulate and manipulatives and and just toys um, that you don't want to do those paper and pencil. It's not developmentally okay it's just not okay and um there's so much you know so much you can read about it and find but 
I think what you can tell, um, it just anyone and everyone who will listen is that you teach children. And so let's think about what they are. And you need to say that question again, because I got on a soapbox. Though. No, I love your soapbox. Keep going. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think um, you you just want to take those practices away and and honor the child, you know. And, you know, it's a little more work getting those activities all out and ready and and different objects for them to do things on and, and, and different sensory type things for the same skill. But you can teach that same skill all day long with all kinds of different things. And your kids are going to love it because you don't want to turn them off to education. You want to turn them on to education. And if we go here with children where they're where they're here and, and we keep going, we're raising that house, but it's not on a foundation yet. Yeah. It's sitting on air. And this air can't be here because we know houses are going to fall down through. They're going to cave in on us. Children cave in on us when they're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and they want to play. Oh, yeah. And everyone's saying, hey, now you got to work. Well, I've been working since I was four. You know, you can't yeah. do that to them. But, you know, children who have played their way through and learned all those concepts by discovery and and manipulating the, the, the materials, they're the ones that understand the concept when you get to paper and pencil. Everybody can do paper and pencil. Come on, face it. Um, if they can't, they can get out their little keyboards and do the keyboard, you know. But we don't have to worry about that, but we do have to worry about concept development. And we won't get that with a flat piece of paper and a pencil. We just yep. okay. Cricket, I, I can't agree with you more. And I think that's even right now, if anybody turns off this talk right here, I think the most important takeaway is that when you play, there's multiple doors to enter into the situation. When you talk about a worksheet, it's flat for a reason. You know, you can't get in there any other way. It's only one way and it's right at the top. So when you talk about, uh, you know, teachers who have children with all sorts of developmental um, ages and stages, if you have a child who is um, a child with autism, a child who is blind, you have all of these different children in your classroom, you give them a worksheet, that's like asking an elephant to climb a tree to prove that, you know, some skill. Give Lots of doors to go in. And that's that multi-sensory approach. We know research says when you have multi-sensory learning, not only kids more engaged, they retain and they're able to retrieve it. Isn't that what we want? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you want them to be able to apply it. And when you give them lots of different materials and lots of, of you know, different um, areas to explore whatever your concept is, what happens is that they apply it here and then they apply it there and then they apply it here and they go, oh, I can do it that. It's almost um, as if we're taking our early childhood children and doing, um, you know, project-based learning with them. Only yeah. they're little. And we are in a sense because what we're doing is giving them the opportunity to take that Legos and do whatever they want with it. They can add with it, they can subtract with it, they can... Um, they can make letters with it. They can um, make cars and roads and or they can build buildings or whatever with it. But you take one tool and you can spread it out in its play. But look how many things you can do with it. But you, ha you have to remember one thing. It is intentional play. So when you're talking with those children and, and, and exploring what they're doing and learning, you have to be intentional as an adult in the situation, uh, how you ask those questions, not what are you doing, building, you know, what, you know, tell me about it. Tell me what you're doing here and how does that, and then you bring in your knowledge and, oh, man, that's just like a freeway, right? So you're building vocabulary. You're doing all those things. So we're the ones that really have to be very intentional because children are always intentional. Yes. Do what they do. Yes. Yeah. So it's not exactly like, all right, here's the open room. Go for it. And I'll be over here in the corner making sure nobody, nobody fights with anybody. No. That's not what you're looking for. No, not at all. Not at all.
So you really do have to, you know, do a lot of planning and, and, yes. and, but there's, oh, there's so many wonderful things you can do with kids that is, that are play. I know we call it recreation as adults. That's what play is, but that's not what play is to children. It's learning. Yeah. And, and I mean, I've heard studies when, you know, children who are forced to, you know, learn to read, which obviously how can you be forced to learn to read, um, you know, by third grade, they're so turned off from school. Maybe they did great in kindergarten and first grade, but they finally said, I'm fed up. And, you know, we start to see behavior issues mm-hmm. and it can be prevented. It can be. And, you know, you don't want to start them too early with um, some of those skills like reading and writing. Um, You want them to do it naturally. And the best way to do that is to model it. You read, 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 read to your babies. I mean, those children, as a kindergarten teacher, I minimum 10 books a day. And people go, oh, how could you do anything else if you're reading 10? You can. Yeah. You them out. You play. um, You have the kids act them out. You have them play. You have them dress up as the characters and, and, and be the characters that's how they learn how to read and they read naturally it's not by skill and drill it's not it's not the flashcard thing it's not the that word is a that word is a that word is it and that word is and you know it's yeah. not that way it has to be very natural in the beginning i know you have to bring in the phonetics and the phonological awareness all those things but you bring them in when it's appropriate and at four or five, and I don't think so. Sorry. Yeah. I yeah. have very successful students that went through um, kindergarten back when we did social emotional kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And we just read to them and enjoyed them and played with them and and you know, you know, stress vocabulary and sentence structure and manners and all the social skills. Guess what? They're doctors and lawyers and chiropractors and all of those things. And they're successful and, and they're leading happy lives. Um, and then we have the group that we shoved through drilling and grilling and, and torturing. I mean, literally torturing. Yeah. And I can, I, can list, I can list off 10 kids right now here and now that I can say hated school before first grade. Yeah. Hated. Yeah. And I don't blame them. Yeah. So you really have to work on those administrations. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the important piece. And that's why there's a sense of urgency for us to get this information out there to everyone who's listening, to anybody who listens to the replay, to anybody who's listening to go tell their co-teacher. We have to be advocates for kids because we want them to be lifelong learners, not just, you know, having, you know, learning in kindergarten and hating it the rest of their lives, you know what works and it still delivers. And I think cricket, what's interesting is just in your longitudinal study that you did within your kids, recognizing that those children who had that social social and emotional kindergarten setting went on to achieve great things. That alone shows us. Truly. And, you know, they were ready for first grade when they went to first grade, but it wasn't drill and kill. Um, They were, you know, and I think that's what we have to remember is that the most important thing about being an educator of early childhood, whether you're a preschool teacher, a kindergarten teacher, or a first grade teacher, is that we want them ready for life. And when you're ready for life, you have to be whole. Um, And that, that comes with, you know, learning all those basic skills about how to take turns, how to get along. Those children who have those good social skills, they can walk into first grade not knowing one letter, one number, how to write their name, how to read, and by the end of the year, they're exactly where they should be. And that's because they have they have perseverance. They've learned that as a, a early childhood child. They've learned They've learned perseverance. They've learned wait time. They and but it's built up, you know. And so, they've learned all those skills that are necessary to survive in life, and they can now learn the necessary things like reading and writing and and doing math. But you've taught it all in play. You've taught them that one block and two blocks is three blocks. They don't have to know what a one or a two or a three looks like to understand that. They, they've learned, oh, ah, ah, apple, you know, they don't have to learn that an A says, ah, yeah, but 
they already know ah and apple go together. They already know those things because you've played with them, you manipulated them, you've made pretend recipes and things like that with them. That it, it it's fun. You have to do it in a more fun way because they come from a world of fun. Yeah, they don't understand this work ethic and. But you build work ethic and perseverance and all those things by starting with little tasks and making them longer and longer and longer and longer. And, oh, can you try again? You're building that. That's what makes a student ready to learn how to read and write and do math. It's not by drilling and grilling them because they they don't learn those skills. They don't learn how to persevere. They give up when they get mad. They give up when they get tired. They give up when it's hard. You know, you haven't learned those things. You didn't play. Exactly. You didn't play. So we're in a obviously the craziest time. I mean, uh, in my life, when it comes to education, <laughs> with all of this online virtual stuff going on, and and inevitably, it it's setting up that that difficulty for children to have that social emotional interactions. And so I'm, I'm looking at Ray's question here, you know, what's happened, what's happening to kids whose kindergarten years right now are spent on zoom without interaction. She's worried about her daughter. So my question is what can parents and caregivers and grandparents be doing at home right now when we don't have that ability to have those kids interacting with other children? You know, it, it is a hard time. It's a hard time for everyone. And, and if they're on Zoom meetings, then I would just encourage teachers um, and, and parents, you can do it. You are, you are your first teacher. The, you're the first teacher of your child. All parents are. That's just the given. Yeah. Also to share that information with, um, with meetings. Yeah, like um, Zoom meetings shouldn't be um, worksheet or doing activities like that. They should be um, talking and, and, and exchanging with kids should be exchanging with kids. Um, yeah, you can do a, a, some of the, you know, you can read them stories and interact them with puppets, but you, need, you really need to get kids interacting. And it's strange to say this, but they can interact over Zoom meetings or team meetings, whatever your school uses, by getting up and doing things together, you know, instead of, um, you know, uh, sitting there watching the screen as a teacher, as a parent, you can get them up and say, Hey, let's, you know, we're going to, we're going to throw out two fists for two and yeah. you know, get them moving and laughing and giggling and enjoying life. And then, you know, as a teacher, um, stop the teaching and, and do something fun with the kids because you really are teaching them. You're teaching them how to live. It's a crazy time, but we need to learn how to live. Yeah. And we'll get them up there being goofy and silly and and making letters. Just like what you would do in your classroom. You yeah. know, don't worry about if it turns out right or you look like a fool. It's okay. <laughs> you should. <laughs> so sometimes I think as teachers, we think, oh my gosh, these parents are now watching. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's kind of a weird feeling. But what's weirder is to think that you're not effective. You know, why am I doing it if I'm not going to be effective? So change your game up, you know, really get the kids involved and get them talking. And even if it sounds like mass chaos, they're learning from each other and they're, you know, you're charging up their self-esteem. Like, I feel good today. I had fun in school. It was on yeah. TV, but oh, fun in school. Yeah. But send, um, send more activities home. Um, I'll tell you what an incident that happened to me uh, this last week, and it made me cry after I got off the phone, literally cry. And it's a Dayton parent. Okay. <laughs> um, here I am in, my, in Washington, and they're calling me from Nevada. But um, a parent calls me, and she's a former um, neighbor, and uh, she's a teacher, too, but she teaches middle school. She has a little guy. He's about three. He's a darling. He can recite The Grinch Stole Christmas from beginning to end with all the characters, the voices and all that. And his teacher, uh, preschool teacher, confronts the mom and says, you need to get him practicing his letters because he doesn't want to do that in, in class. He just doesn't want to do that. And, um, his, and she has a whiteboard. They have a whiteboard with a little marker. You know, that's what they're doing. And 
<laughs> um, I'm sure that if I, she had seen me and my face was, you know, ready to come unglued, I was pretty up, upset about it. And I said, well, I think that um, you can do some nice things like take a cookie sheet and smear glue all over it and put sand on it and let it dry in the oven on 225 for a while. Take a bunch of cookie sheets into the teacher and put a layer of sand on each and say, this is our gift to you. Or when they want to write with the, you know, little letters, if you want them to write little letters or little shapes or draw themselves or whatever, he can do it with his finger and oh, you can feel that kinesthetic that's going to, you can say P and he could try to do P if he wants to, but if he just wants to draw a face, that's okay. And I, you know, I was being sarcastic. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I really did mean for her to take the trays in and I told her I'd sit, you can make some and send them to her if she wanted yeah. to. Um, what, you know, it, it just all goes back to what we know is right and wrong and to tell parents that get out the beans out of, you know, get out those pinto beans you haven't cooked and they're, they're getting old. Get out those noodles. They're all cheap. Get yeah. out that rice. Make some letters. Make some numbers. Make some shapes. Make some pictures. Um, use what you have. But when you have teachers, and there are many of us out there, I mean, I used to be a ditto queen. I'm telling you. Yeah. Um, back in the 70s, wow. Yeah. You know, that's all we knew. We didn't know any better. And we did what was what our um, student teacher, you know, experience was. And I did mine in fourth grade because the first grade teacher got sick on me. So, <laughs> um, you know, you did a lot of that, but we don't have to do that anymore. And so whatever concept the teacher's trying to teach, use what you have in your home. Yeah. And improvise, use other things. Don't, don't let a day go by where you think you have to do all those worksheets because guess what? You don't, the sky's not going to fall and hell's not going to freeze over. Yeah. You know? And you can throw them in the garbage and say you lost them or, <laughs> or at. Yeah. And, and, and little Susie and Billy are going to be fine because you've done fun things with them, the same things in a different way. And I think that's what we have to do as parents. We have to do that as educators too. You know, lighten up and remember you're teaching children who are hurting right now too. They don't mm -hmm. have their friends. Yeah. They don't have their toys. They don't have their dance lessons. They don't have their soccer ball practice. They don't have their whatever they do. They don't have the the play groups that we were doing with them, all those things we do with our little people at home. So now you're their best friend and you're also the parent. And yeah. so yeah. if you've got to sit down and play um, tea set and talk about how the weather is with your child to teach them about weather and how, how, you know, manners and eating and do that, you do it because that's yeah. our job. We're parents, you know, but we're also their little playmates right now. Yeah, you know? exactly. Weird place exactly. to be. You're not yeah. their best friend, though. You're their playmate. You're not That's their best right. friend. You're their friend. <laughs> well, I think one, you know, one thing that I'm hearing from you, and I think we all need to really remember this. When you're an educator, you got to think outside the box, oh, yeah. outside the worksheet, because we want to create kids who also think outside the box. If we want to create these great thinkers who go on to, and, you know, start Tesla and Google and all of these different never heard of concepts, then we've got to give them the opportunity to teach, to, to think outside that box. And so I encourage all of you who are listening to think of what are 10 different ways I can teach a concept? Because I think we start to get into this box where we think it has to be done one way. But the thing is, Kids are thinking in all sorts of different ways, providing lots of different ways to do it can, of course, also empower that child who learns a different way, a door to go in. Absolutely. You know, save those egg cartons and, and boxes and things because kids who build and create, um, you know, you just find so much out about them and you'll find out what they're interested in and what sets them off to explore something, the next thing. Yep. You know? Absolutely. 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 Let them well, know. thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time to give us your wisdom. I really feel like all of those who listened have just gotten even more empowered. You know what you're doing is right. 
But sometimes it's hard to get those words to put together. So here we are, we have veteran Cricket who has been um, teaching kids she knows what works. Keep doing what you're doing, keep playing, keep having fun. Learning should be fun and all about connection. Yeah, and be your, you know, be your child's biggest advocate, you know, get out there and, and speak to other families, speak to teachers, administrators and say, hey, you know, yeah. I just, I want the best for my child. And, and you're the one, you're the only one who can do it with the force that you can. But teachers, you speak up for your kids, you speak up for your families, because that's why we're here. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Cricket, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to everyone who has joined uh, tonight. And if you watch in the replay, and if you have a question, just go ahead and put replay in quotes. And then I'll be sure to jump in and um, leave a little comment about that. So thank you again. I hope that you have a great night. And maybe we'll be having you back with some more questions about what to do now that we get when the we get the kids back in the classroom. <laughs> it be fun. We started our day, first day. Oh, awesome. Awesome, awesome. Best day ever. <laughs> totally, totally. All right. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us. Have a great Tuesday. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.